Not so long ago, I created content where I described how we can solder, hand solder, tiny SMD or surface mount LEDs to this little printed circuit board. We were doing this to create an LED luminaire for a custom dimmable lighting control circuit. After doing it a bunch of times, I realized that the process was really not all that reliable. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, and the process just took too long. I thought there had to be a better way. See, the pros use all sorts of fancy things like wave soldering machines or reflow soldering systems, but many of these things are way too pricey or impractical for a hobbyist like myself. The good news though, reflow soldering has a few options that are attainable at a reasonable budget. For example, there are these things called hot air reflow stations or hot air ovens, which basically work on the principle of increasing the air temperature um, so hot enough so that solder melts. But my problem with these two things is that both of them require the stuff called solder paste. So it's basically like the sticky material that you apply to or pre-apply to the pads. And then you put your surface mount devices on top of those pads and the, the solder paste holds them in place. But in order to apply the solder paste to the PCB, you have to get these stencils made along with your PCB. Now, getting the stencil is not a problem. Every time I've ordered a PCB from my manufacturer, they have the option of providing the stencil. And you can also buy solder paste online, but quite frankly, I find this stuff pretty expensive for the amount that you get. And for all the existing PCBs that I have, I don't have any stencils for them. So what I really wanted to use was just regular plain old solder. And I'm not really interested in using these hot air reflow stations because I've heard that they can actually melt some of the components. And also I've heard that it's quite tedious because you can only focus on one area at a time. I'd rather get the entire board warm so the whole thing can be made at once, much like the way a reflow oven operates. But see, my problem with the reflow oven is because it's in an enclosed space, I can't add the solder which requires me to use solder paste. And I'd really just like to use regular solder. So what I really need is a flat surface area that can get warm enough to melt solder, but is open so that way I can add solder to the hot board, thereby melting it right on the pads. So I put together this monstrosity. This is a, a pizza pan that I just found uh, around the house and it was perforated. So it was, it was really nice that it was perforated actually. Uh, it's made of aluminum. And this uh, thing in the back, this is a, a grill that's electric. So you can see the plugs over here. You can use it to grill burgers or whatever. So I thought because this pizza pan had perforated holes, it actually made it really easy to screw it in. All I gotta do is heat this thing up, place the PCB on top of this, and you can actually see the little outline I made here because, oh, it worked so well. So the way, this was a complete coincidence, but the, the way that I designed these PCBs, it's got two little holes on those, and, th and those two holes are used to kind of clamp it to whatever luminaire it's gonna be attached to also serves as a heatsink. And it just happened to work that the holes lined up perfectly with the pizza pan preparations. So man, I'm like, this This was a match made in heaven. It had to work. So I did that. I attached this to this. I plugged it in, waited for the thing to heat up, and uh, it actually worked all right. I was struggling with the large heating surface area, so I had to use one of these things to protect myself as I was uh, working away on it. Um, but you know, at the end, it actually worked. I was able to solder three LEDs to this printed circuit board um, without any injuries. <laughs> Although I have to admit, I didn't feel all that safe going through it. I did not burn myself, so that was good, but I'm feeling like if I did it a few more times, I might have. So although it worked, I wanted something that's a little bit more, let's say, safe. And also, I wanted to have a little bit more control over the temperature. So I went to our favorite online shopping experience and found this. Now I must say, the manufacturers or the sellers of this device did not pay me at all to include this. This is my honest opinion about this device. I bought it because, well, it's got a pretty big surface area. And look at that, it's got a temperature control and a readout. So I thought, this might be a safer way to solder these LEDs onto this PCB. The particular flavor of solder that I'm using is this alloy, which is 63% tin and 37% lead. So yes, it's leaded alloy. So make sure you have adequate ventilation if you're gonna use leaded alloy. It melts at approximately 183 degrees Celsius. So I thought, great, let's set this thing at 190 degrees, let it heat up and see what happens. Fair warning, if you're gonna get one of these things, nothing happens fast. It took 
a whole lot of time to heat up to 190 degrees, but eventually it did get there. As soon as the temperature gauge read 190 degrees Celsius, I popped a blank circuit board onto the surface and tried to immediately melt some solder, and it wasn't working. This thing just wasn't getting hot enough to melt the solder, so I cracked open the manual. Um, I probably should have read the manual before running it for the first time, but hey. It did say in this thing that it goes from 0 to 400 degrees Celsius. It also also says don't run this thing at over 100 or you risk melting and I thought well why would it go to 400 degrees Celsius if it's going to melt at 100 so I effectively ignored the warning and I said well if this thing can reach 400 degrees Celsius that's quite hot maybe perhaps it was supposed to say Fahrenheit I don't know I set it to 190 and it wasn't melting the the solder so I thought ah Let's, let's assume that this is Fahrenheit. So using the Fahrenheit scale, I can see that my solder melts at 361 degrees Fahrenheit. So I set this at 375 and let it warm up. As soon as it reached 375, I put the PCB back on the surface and I immediately started to try to melt the solder. And as you would expect, it melted immediately. Look how quickly it melted. But I was also noticing something a little bit different here. The white um, solder mask that I have on top of this PCB started changing color. <laughs> yeah, it's changing color because the manual is correct. This thing does go to 400 degrees Celsius. And so I really was cooking this thing at 375 degrees Celsius, which is too hot. Nonetheless, it worked. I was able to melt the solder, attach my PCBs, and um, take a look at this lovely little brown shade I have on my printed circuit board. Oh my gosh, yeah. The other thing I didn't like is the blobs of solder that were showing up. And I wonder if that's because the flux was evaporating. See, inside every solder, well, most solder, there's usually a small amount of flux. This one says it's got 2% of flux in it. And flux is a chemical that makes soldering easier. It actually is supposed to wet the surface so the flux, so the solder doesn't bubble up like that. It's going to be nice and smooth. But um, it can evaporate a little bit too fast. And I think that's what's happening here because I was cooking this thing at 375 degrees Celsius. So after realizing my mistake, I let the thing cool down completely, set it back to 190. And I said to myself, all right, let's let this thing stabilize a little bit. But this time to try to help the process along, I applied some liquid flux to the surface. And as you can see, I ended up um, burning the tips of my brush a little. So uh, probably not the best idea to do that when it's hot. The flux appeared to evaporate, but the solder still didn't melt. So this time, rather than applying the flux directly to a hot PCB, I pre-applied the flux to the cold PCB and then placed it on the hot plate. Now the flux appeared to evaporate on this attempt as well, but I still couldn't get the solder to melt. So apparently it turns out that while the flux solvent is evaporating, the actual stuff of the flux that does its job doesn't necessarily evaporate with that solvent, as long as the temperature's not too high. So I thought maybe I can up the temperature a little bit, let the solvent of the flux evaporate, but the flux would still be able to do its job. So this time I set it to 210 and I tried again. And at 210 degrees Celsius with a pre-applied flux, the solvent did evaporate, but the flux still worked. My solder did melt. I was able to solder on the LEDs to the board. So it appears that pre-applying the flux and setting the temperature to 200 degrees Celsius worked really well. And then when I went to go test all the boards, they all worked, even the severely overcooked one. So if you don't mind the shade or the pleasant shade of brown on it, um, you can probably go ahead and cook this thing at 375 degrees. Worked just fine. I'm not gonna do it anymore because cooking it at 210 also worked equally as well, and I got to maintain that lovely um, silkscreen color that I had originally planned on these LEDs having. I'm really happy with the results. So now I have a reliable, repeatable way to create these LED chips, and I did so with this device that I bought online for less than $100 Canadian. That's not that bad, actually. Um, and if you're really adventurous, you could use the method of using a pizza pan contraption. Hey, that worked just as well. So we've explored three methods of soldering these LEDs to this printed circuit board. A hand soldering, a pizza pan grill, or the online purchase of a hot plate. I prefer the latter uh, for obvious reasons that we just went through. Um, but regardless how you make this, our next step is to create the enclosure around this so we can continue our journey to create this uh, custom interior lighting system.